I use the mic? Can everybody hear? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So really, I'm here to help you all, um, and I think more than anything else, you know, just talking to a lot of uh, the college coaches, high school coaches, club coaches, lacrosse recruiting is broken. It is. It is definitely not the way it should be, and we can't really change it. So we feel compelled, and I speak for a lot of college coaches, to come out and try to help and just provide you with insight give you our perspectives on some things, but also let you ask some questions. So really, this is really not about me tonight. Um, I did put together a PowerPoint after talking to some, some different you know, players and parents and, and such, some, some basic things that I put down and it's kind of a collection of that, but certainly I want you all, like if you have questions or you're worried about something or you heard something, at any time, please just stop me. Um, again, I don't really have an agenda here. Uh, except for helping you all. And again, I'm not going to answer maybe every question to, to, to maybe everyone's satisfaction in terms of fixing some of these things, but I will give you an honest answer whether you like it or not, or whether it's what you want to hear, or maybe what you do want to hear. Um, I'll try to do it to the best of my ability. Um, and it just kind of worked out. Uh, my journey's been phenomenal. Uh, I think anybody that coaches, whether you're talking, you know, uh, a five year old, or you're coaching at a high school or college. Coaching is coaching, and coaching is awesome. And working with young people and going on a journey every year is there's nothing better. Um, and to do it at any level is pretty exciting, uh, especially with young people when you start at one place and you see their personal growth, obviously develop as athletes, uh, and just seeing a collection of young people get together and make sacrifices and hopefully succeed, but all the, the little things you can learn along the way, it is, it is, very, to me, it's every year you're excited about that new journey. So uh, having been, you know, at a Division three and having been at an Ivy School and having been at Service Academy, I've just seen a lot of places and they've all been awesome. Um, so I'm going to do my best to try to kind of give you some of the, some of the info and, and some things that I learned that were helpful. But at any time, if you have questions, please stop me. Um, really, I think the first slide is pretty important. Let's see if I can do this right. Um, and I will echo this to you. Um, it's really not the first place, it's the best place. And eventually, uh, find a place that you really want to be. And if you are a good player, a good student, and a good person, you will find a home. Um, it may not be at the time frame you want, but there's like the old saying in life, you don't always really get it when you want it. But a lot of times if you can get it, you're happy you get it. Um, case in point, I was just talking to Brian. We just did our NLIs last week, our national letter of intent. So for you guys that end up uh, going the Division One route, um, you would basically get a contract that's sent to you. And it's either emailed, um, it's scanned and emailed, which most people are doing now, or you'll get it FedEx to you. You basically get it, it's your contract, you double check it, you have to wait a couple days, and then uh, from last Wednesday until tonight at 11.59, you send that back, and that's basically your contract. That's you're coming, you're committed, you're bound by what's called the NLI, um, and that's what we've been doing. What I can tell you is we have four guys that have returned their NLIs that, as of and you can only sign them as a senior. We have four 2017s. July 1st, they were not on our radar. So they wait. They either were looking at other schools, and they had done other things, or maybe they were looking at somewhere else, and it didn't work out. But in the last five months or so, something happened and now they're coming to obviously a different school. So things happen. So um, don't be, you know, again, I know it's an anxious process and it's okay to feel that way. Never give up. Keep control of the things that you can control we'll over some of those things. But if you, if you really focus on the, the important things and we realize some of you, what's maybe holding you back is just you have to grow in your body. You're a late bloomer, you know, you just mature late, you know, and all of a sudden you're gonna grow. But if you're a good kid, a good player, and a good student, you will find a home. I promise you that. Um, and even if it's senior year, like coaches will find a way to get you to their school if they really, really like you and feel like you're worth it. Um, so I can't echo that enough. So I was, we was talking about how, like a process of making a good decision. And for the parents, this will seem um, you know, pretty logical, but if you were buying a house or buying a car, right? when we talk about it with our players, 
getting that first job or that internship? Well, why would you take one or the other? Well, let's figure out, okay, what are really the most important factors for you? And sometimes when people make choices and they commit earlier, people are like, well, how could you do that? And, and I'm not here to judge whether you should or shouldn't commit early, but for the guy that does commit early, you can usually knock down your list very quickly. The first two, size of the school and location. If you want to go to a big school and you don't want to go too far away from home because you're close to your family or you have a big family, you can knock that list down very, very quickly, okay? Conversely, you want a big school or a small school, well, okay, and you want to go far away from home, well, your options are going to be, you know, pretty wide open. So, um, again, those are to me two that can knock down your list quite quickly. Uh, other things that are important, obviously some schools are going to be a little bit more diverse than others. I think Kelmer Hall seems to be a school that has a lot more diversity, which I think is an awesome thing. I think the fourth one there, for each person, this could be the most important thing. So let's say you're a guy that, um, I coached a, a guy a few years ago, Curtis Holmes, who was a terrific player for us, much of McDonough. Um, he's dyslexic, super bright guy, but just the way his brain saw letters, a little bit different, took him a little bit longer. Um, so the academic support became really important to him. He's a smart kid, just, again, a little bit different. So having that academic support was really important to him. So when you go to a school, if that's important as a parent, okay, that's a great question to have. Hey, just want to talk to you. What do you do for your athletes? Uh, do you have a study hall? Do you have a person that, that directs that? Hey, you know, maybe set up a meeting with them. That could be really helpful. Um, finances, we have broken the $70,000 mark a year for colleges. For you young guys, you're probably hitting six figures by the time you get there. Congratulations. Um, so, obviously schools are different, so that's, schools are very pricey, um, yeah, there's a few that hit 70, um, the private schools, some of them are pretty high, the state universities can run from, if you're in state, all the way down to about 20 for everything, 10,000 for about tuition, to out of state, another state university, um, out of state's about uh, somewhere from 40 to 50 a lot of times. Um, so you can usually go anywhere from about 20 to 7. So a lot of things there. And we'll talk about how you finance that in a little bit. Socially, okay, depending on what's important to you young guys, uh, your social experience. You know, being in the city, uh, maybe having a big friend I like, maybe not, um, whatever it may be, that can be important to you. The academic experience, some guys, you know, hey, I love engineering and I really want to just dig in. I love this engineering program, um, or I really want business. This, this business program allows you all these internships, and, and they take all these field trips, whatever it may be, that can be important. The thing that I think that it's really hard to convey, and you just kind of sense it when you're a player, when you walk around schools, sometimes it just feels right. Um, and I think in a perfect world, you'll figure out which ones are most important to you, what are your deal breakers, and if you can get like a checklist and a priority, sometimes people will value them and they'll say, all right, you know what, we're gonna give this school a five, we're gonna give this school a three, and they do a little bit of a matrix, which I think can be helpful. Um, but the feel is just intangible. When you just feel, walk on that campus, it feels right. And for any of you that go to Comfort Hall or go to Loyola, or wherever you went, um, if you walked on the campus and you just felt right, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You did a shadow day and you just liked it. So I think in a perfect world, if you get that feel and you check out most of your boxes, you're going to be right where you need to be. And then once you get those, you can figure out, at least with some of these big categories, find the schools that have the things that you want. A lot of times you have this vision of, I really, I like Syracuse's uniform and I want to play in the Carrier Dome, which is really cool. Um, but they don't have that program you're looking for. And it's a little too far away. All right, well, let's just step back. Is that really our best choice? Certainly a great program and a great school. Um, and then on top of that, there are unique differences between programs. And this is something that, you know, when you go do a visit, talk to the players, talk to the parents, talk to the alums. Um, every program is going to have a culture. And I think that's a great question for parents. Hey, you know, it seems like you have a really good program here. Talk to me, what's your culture? What do, you, what do you value? Like, what do you, what do you emphasize to the kids? What are the kids like? Um, and I think that's something that I would personally want to know. Uh, kind of segues into team values. You can ask that question. 
Uh, for players, when you guys are doing a visit, talk to the players. Hey, you know, what do you want to do, you know, after you graduate? Hey, what do you guys do for fun? Kind of get a sense of, do I like what you like? Because if, if you don't really have a lot in common with the players, okay, practice ends, and you're hanging out with them on the weekend, or even you don't want to hang out with them on the weekend, to me, it just doesn't seem like you have that great bond. Um, coaching styles, uh, I think coaching styles, a lot of times you can see that, whether you go to a practice or a game. Um, as you can tell, I'm a very intimidating guy. Um, you know, our guys are very scared of me. Um, I wish I was 6'5", but I'm not. Uh, but some coaches definitely are big yellers, okay? And you gotta be okay with that. Some coaches are more laid back, some guys are be passionate. Um, I think, obviously, as a coach, hopefully you can, you can kind of morph into what you need to be for each guy to maximize who they are. But some coaches, they may get on you pretty good, and if you are just not comfortable with that, okay, that's good for you to know going in. Uh, maybe you want a guy that's going to get on you because you need that. Something to think about. Uh, expectations. Some programs, the expectations are going to be a little bit higher than others. Uh, and that could be a good thing, but also no, maybe at that school you're, you're going to be watched pretty, pretty closely. You know, we always give the example to our guys, hey, if you're playing football down in Alabama, you do something dumb socially, it's all over. And so just know, like, you're under the microscope, so you got to be good with your choices. Um, and then the last one i got to put together, certain programs do a lot with their alums. I think for most programs, they actually do a great job. Uh, but talk to the coaches about, hey, what, what about after? You know, what, what can I, what, what does your program do outside of maybe the Office of Career Services for the university? What do you do for your kids for internships, professional development, uh, guest speakers, um, jobs? Do you use that? Uh, that? Those are really good questions. So you got some pretty good talking points just right here. When you go in to talk to a coach, culture, values, uh, you know, professional development, that makes the conversation, I think, when you're in the office or eventually talking to the coach on the phone, you have some pretty good talking points. Um, kind of segues into this, and I think most of the coaches, you have a great program here at FCA. At the end of the day, finding a place where the broken leg test, if you broke your leg, would you still be happy? We all think it's going to be perfect, you're going to be that amazing player, you know, guys should be carrying off the field after the big goal. Sometimes you get hurt. Sometimes you get some concussions. Things don't work out the way you want. And or do you love the school? And I think that's a great question to ask if you're a parent. Hey, take lacrosse out of it. Would you still want to go here? Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when I was coaching at Harvard, um, we had uh, admissions process in certain schools. You will do an application. Um, a lot of times you'll have a local alum who might interview you, you'll come to your house, or you'll meet them somewhere, and you'll interview them. And then a lot of times at Harvard, uh, kids would come up to campus and they do an on-campus interview. And as you can imagine, at Harvard, they have these really nice buildings, and you walk in, and you're in this waiting room, and everybody's really dressed up, and everybody looks really stressed out because they're meeting with the admissions people, and it looks like Harvard. They have the pictures of like these people that look like they went to Harvard 200 years ago. They've been on the wall, the furniture's really nice. Um, I kind of wonder what I'm doing in there when I'm in there. Uh, but they would they basically bring you in, and, and it was a great way to help your cause in admissions, where you could just go in and you know sell yourself in a lot of ways. So when I first got to Harvard, I knew a guy Smitty, he was a face-off guy for us, and I was like, hey Smitty, what's 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 the deal with the admissions interview? What was that like? And he's like, well, they used to come in and they used to, they ask questions, and I'm like, well, what type of questions? They like, they give you the broken leg question. I go, well, what's the broken leg question? It's like, well, they'll basically ask you, hey, if you broke your leg and you play, couldn't play the cross, like, what would you do? I'm like, all right, well, Smitty, what did you say? He goes, I told him I play football. So, so the smartest Harvard guys are sometimes they're not the smart. We give them credit. So, and that is a true score, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so the answer to that is, you know, maybe I'd write for the newspaper, you know, I'd get involved in school. <coughs> so at least you got something out of tonight. Um, in my opinion, your best resources are your current coaches, right? At FCA, you have coaches that have gone to a lot of different places. When in doubt, trust them. Like, we are biased, college coaches. We can't help but love our school and our kids. 
we're going to love our place. We are. So separate that, and when it comes down to it, the people who really care about you are your coaches. So ask them, hey, what do you think? And, and certainly they're not going to tell you where to go, but they'll probably walk you through the process, and they're going to be unbiased. They just want you to be happy and have a great experience. So I would trust them the most, because any alum is going to try to push you towards that school too. So you almost need to bunker in a little bit and find the people that are the least biased, and I think you have great coaches here that will do that. Recruiting interest, some people are faster, and some people just do more of it, and then it's a little bit of a, a style thing for the school. Uh, some people will offer you right away, some people a little bit slower. It doesn't mean that they don't want you, it just may be that they're a little bit slower in the process, and maybe they're a little bit more meticulous. Um, so I would definitely be careful of, well, they, they offer me first and they just want me more. Well, they just may offer everybody faster, and that could be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but I wouldn't get too caught up in that. Um, obviously, this one's pretty easy, right? The, the big fish, little fish, depending on playing time. You may have been, come on in. <laughs> All right, good to see you. Right. What's happening? Good to see you. you got it. <laughs> I feel like I should be doing a commercial for Mini Water Spring. <laughs> when I pick this up, my self esteem goes up. It's so, it's so, uh, so um, you may have been a guy that you've never sat. You've played off your whole career, and you do not want to sit the bench. All right, well, then I think you have to be realistic. Come on in. Um, you may be a guy that's like, listen, I don't really care about playing time. I'll get what I earn. You know, like, so for you, that's not as big a deal. But I do think it's something you need to think about. Because if you're a guy that's never, like, basically been on the bench and you would go nuts if you did, that, that could be important. Um, that's where I think go to practice and watch. You go to practice, you can, you're a, a face-off guy. You look and you think you're better than those guys. Or a goalie, I could beat all those guys out. That's where you can judge. Um, reclassing, obviously a big thing these days. I'll give you my perspective on things. If you feel like it's the best thing for you, you won't be penalized. But we do look at birth dates, and if you decide not to, like, that won't be held against you either. Okay, so that is a family choice. There's cost considerations. We do look at birth dates, so if someone's 12 months older, 12 months younger, or really young, we do factor that in. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't tell what's gonna happen in anybody. So we're projecting, but I don't think if you don't feel like you really want to, I would not be pressured in, but if you really feel like it's the best thing for you and your family, then that's your prerogative. My, um, uh, my, basically my partner in crime at times down at Maryland, Kathy Reese, our women's coach, is an awesome coach. Um, she is going through that with her son. Her son is a seventh grader, and he plays for the Rough Riders, and her husband, Brian, played at Maryland. He's a great guy. Uh, their son in seventh grade, and he's a 22, I guess that is. He's really small, and they're going through that right now. And I don't know what he's going to do, but they're kind of wrapping their arms around it. Um, so I'm not trying to dodge it, but I do think if, if you decide you want to stay in that class, go for it. If you want to like spend the money and you feel like it's important, which Kathy may decide to do, like we understand that too. So I just feel like there's a lot of like, oh my God, I have to do it. I don't think you have to do it, um, but we will kind of consider birthdays at times, um, and it doesn't mean that's a huge factor, but it's just something we're going to look at, and we kind of feel like we have to, um, especially for people. And listen, we've seen on uh, North, you know, the guys that go to prep school there. We see double, triple reclasses. That's to me is when it gets like, you know, we're watching and we're looking at birthdays so like, well, that guy's dominating, but like, he drove here. And, he's like, he's here. <laughs> uh, and we hear all the jokes. You know, it's, you know, it's always, it's always that, like, Massachusetts. Right? <laughs> Those guys are like on the 21 team and they went to the prom last year. <laughs> saw one of them in a shaving commercial. <laughs> There's another team, I'm not gonna say, it's gonna do that. Uh, so we got all that, and just know that, like, we take that into consideration. Okay? So I told you we try to have a little bit of money. Um, and we kind of mentioned the divisions. 
it doesn't matter what the vision is. Don't get hung up on the whole thing, one thing. When I coached that, and the governor, our kids cared about lacrosse just as much as anybody else. They were passionate, they loved it, they watched their film, they practiced their butts off. You know, Brian can speak to that too. Like, just being happy at that school and loving your teammates and loving where you're at and feel like you're at the right place, that's what it's all about. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and again, being a Division III All-American, being first, being a guy that really doesn't get much playing time, I know where I'd probably rather be, you know? Hey, getting on the field and, and being that team captain, I think that's pretty special. Um, all right, so I thought this was pretty interesting. Took this off of the NCAA website. You can dig up this. Some pretty cool facts. Um, I did my best. I'm not the greatest with computers and stuff like that. But obviously, you can see lacrosse. Um, and you can see the odds of playing. I would say that in this area, the odds are going to be way up because of the history, the coaching, um, the fact that you guys get great skill training. But to me, one thing you can take from this is, hey, not everybody gets to Division One, Two, or Three. So if you do, it's pretty darn special, right? Your sons have done something really awesome, and as parents, obviously you're going to be proud of them. But also for you young guys, like you know, if you're from California or maybe you're from Florida, like those numbers are probably down. So it says that you've gotten a lot of support, you've had great coaching, your parents have made a lot of sacrifices, but you have done something pretty darn special. Uh, you also see that, obviously in lacrosse, there's uh, maybe fewer opportunities than maybe some other sports, but it's, for some other sports, you're really not competing as much. So pretty interesting. And I think the next one is kind of interesting, just as, uh, just kind of explaining the financial side of things. Long and short, looking at this, there is no pot of gold in lacrosse. There just isn't, right? If you look at the two big ones here, uh, look at football. Um, Football, basically, they're right in the middle, about the seventh one down, or whatever it may be. So you got football, 85 and 63, okay? Take those out, and you're, you're looking at 11, 13, 12, 4, 4. There aren't that many. So, again, like there are other ways to get money, and we'll talk about it. Keeping your grades up for academic money, and there's also financial aid. So there just it, there really isn't that much money for the sport of lacrosse. You can see for us 12.6. We just we we'll just typically say 12. You know you have 45 guys on the team, right? Or 48, let's say. So you know you're talking about 20, 25 percent max uh, per guy on average per guy. But let's say you have Mikey Powell and he's the greatest player in high school. Yeah, he may get a pretty good scholarship. Well, as a college coach, if you're gonna give him a big scholarship, that means that there's now you're down to maybe two or close to two for the rest of your class. So the, I think the example I always give is not unfortunately, it's one that hits local. A few years ago, Ravens win the Super Bowl. Well, they give Flacco a big contract. He certainly deserved a big contract, awesome year. Well, you have a salary cap, you give 20 million to Joe, Who's going to block and who's going to catch? And, it, 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 and again, you don't want to lose Joe. He's really good. But something's got to give. So when you're on the other side of this as a college coach, you're, you're doing money management. You get three scholarships a year. It just doesn't go very far. So you don't always recruit maybe the most highly decorated guys. You recruit the guys that make the most sense. And when you're building a class, you're just trying to stretch a dollar like any family does from week to week. So you're trying to be prudent. Because you need depth, you need to make sure you have guys in every position that can compete. Because if you don't, the guys at the college level, one, two, uh, one, two and three, your weakness is to watch the film and they'll find those weaknesses. If you guys want to come out, you can come out. If not, I'll let you guys check. So, scholarships, financial aid, big picture stuff. Uh, Division one, 70 teams. Division two, 65. Uh, I would say probably in the next few years, there'll be more Division two teams. Division one, and you can see that number, and I thought it was important to put up there. You know, you're looking at really three, and, and soon it will be probably four times as many Division three schools as Division one schools. Division one probably won't expand too much more. Um, Title nine um, is really kind of complicating things. I totally understand. Um, basically, for you young guys, um, there's a rule that at your school. The number of athletes and scholarships for the men and the women have to be, on average, proportional to 
the student body. So if you have 50% men and women at your school, you basically need to uh, offer 50% scholarships to the men and the women. Um, if you're, you know, 80-20, yeah, you can have more men's team and offer more things because you just have more men at your school. So what does that mean? You just saw the slide. Football has 80 and 65 scholarships. Okay, well there is no like women's football, so how do you make up those scholarships? Because you're gonna have basketball, men's and women's typically, you're gonna have baseball, softball. So if you wanted to start lacrosse, which is another 12 and 45 roughly guys playing at your school, you have to add enough women's programs to balance out that, but you also have those 80 that you gotta make up for football. And there is no equivalent. So maybe it's gym, women's gymnastics, maybe it's crew. Uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe I'm trying to think of something else, but uh, at the end of the day, it, it, it means that right now it's probably not expanding. Uh, for, for all the, the young college <coughs> coaches at some point, maybe you thought, hey, it'll be like the women, Oregon, USC, Stanford, Vanderbilt, some amazing places, North, North uh, Western. With football, it's just going to hold things back. Um, so I don't see it changing a whole lot. I certainly hope it does, but. Realistically, we kind of are where we are. So you can see, you know, there are a lot more homes at the second, third um, level there than there are below, are below that 70. Uh, in terms of the scholarship stuff, okay, uh, Ivy Leagues, some of the Patriots, and Division Three, everything is really financial aid or need-based aid. Uh, what does that mean? They look at how much family income you have. Um, schools will ask you to fill out what's called a FAFSA form, which is basically they'll ask you for some tax information. You fill it out, you send it in, a school looks at it, and then each school will basically determine how much financial aid they're going to give you. Um, schools are different. You could look at six schools in a conference, and you can get six different financial aid briefs. Um, some schools have very strong endowments. When I was at Harvard, the endowment was off the charts. They had unbelievable financial aid. Expensive school, but great financial aid. So we always were trying to do reads on guys. You just never do. Um, so it was hard, obviously, for people that live like in Baltimore, right, or in <coughs> or in the New York area. You have to make a lot of money to live in those areas. So maybe the financial aid isn't quite as great. In my opinion, I would always try to get the read. Um, and a lot of times you can go to a school's website and they'll have a financial aid calculator right there and they'll do an estimate. Uh, obviously it's not perfect, but they'll ask you some, some, big, some, some big financial questions like you know, what you made, make some tax info, and sometimes they can spit out an estimate for you. Uh, but I would certainly at least go down the road and see if you, if you get anything. If they tell you no, they tell you no. Uh, obviously service academies are great deals. Uh, you actually get a stipend and a job. Uh, awesome places, always worth a look. The one thing I would tell you about a service academy is most of the guys that are playing on that lacrosse team didn't grow up thinking this is what I want to do. They just came down to visit and saw a great opportunity um, and they learned, wow, this could be a really good thing for me. So I would certainly, if you get uh, one of the schools reaching out to you, certainly take a look. You can decide whether you want to do that, uh, but Again, don't fall into the, well, you know, those guys, that's all they want to do. Most of the guys, when we were there, they, the first time they thought about it was when we reached out. Um, so just in terms of Division I <coughs> info, um, and I'll obviously, um, you know, have Brian weigh in a little bit with the Division Three stuff too, but, um, so the whole uh, contacting stuff, college coaches at the Division I level can text you, email you, we'll call you September 1 of junior year. Um, you can call a coach anytime you want. There is never a time that you can't call a college coach. There are recommended times now to call a college coach or butt dial them at 2 a.m. Just, just saying. Um, but that's, I would not do that, um, but it's happened. Um, and then, then you hear what's going on. What's going bad. But, so you can always call them, but we can't call you back until uh, September 1 of junior year. So uh, I'll walk you through kind of the whole, the process of how, how contact is made before then. But um, a lot of times what can be helpful, I'm sure uh, the FCA guys are really good at it. Uh, but you know, texting a coach, hey coach, I'm gonna call you at seven o'clock. 
Uh, if that's not good, could you please tell Coach Kelly, you know, a good time, and then you coordinate it and you make it happen. Um, and Brian can talk probably a little bit more about Division Three, but they can call earlier. They, their rules are a lot more relaxed. So, you know, Coach Kelly is on the phone with like fifth graders trying to seal the <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, Just briefly, so really Division Three, as I mentioned earlier, is sort of what the world is. There are very few rules. The only rule that exists in, in Division Three recruiting is a face-to-face -face contact with a, with a recruit family member. Uh, can't take place until after uh, the sophomore year has ended. So once once school has ended, the end of their sophomore year, then a face-to-face -face contact can happen. Um, and that really, that, that's really it. You know, so it's not a June 1 date or a July 1 date or September 1 date. It is a completion of, of your sophomore year. Other than that, text, phone calls. Um, you know, I'm coaching the 2025 team, so if any of you are out there, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, there's, there are very few rules. The one thing I will say too, just going back relative to FAFSA, there's a new rule in place um, that, that, that the federal government finally kind of helped families out and is allowing uh, you to use the prior year's uh, tax returns. So if you have a rising senior uh, that's applying for colleges, you can actually submit uh, the FAFSA starting October 1st. So we're in that period. You can get that information to financial aid offices and, and get a financial aid read back sooner than, than it had been in the past. You had to wait until January 1, and you had to wait for the you know, 2016 year uh, taxes to be uh, completed, get your W-9, and, and compress the time frame for families to make decisions uh, realistically relative to, especially talking about the, the rising cost of um, that is a good thing. So again, you can you can use uh, the FAFSA going forward on October first. Um, and one little thing: uh, sometimes people take it the wrong way. You're, you know, we're in November. We're in all these tournaments. Um, we're really not supposed to do anything more than hey, how you doing? You know, and that's about it at, at the tournament. So if, if coaches are really talking about the phone. Uh, or on their campus, but then they're at a tournament and they're short with it. It's only because we're trying to follow the rules. And that's always a tough one because you don't want to be disrespectful. And you're really excited to see people, uh, but you, you obviously don't want to overdo it. So it's that fine line you're walking. So if, if coaches aren't super aggressive with you there, just know like we really are trying to follow the rules. But obviously, if we see you, we want to say hello and, and, and be cordial. Um, all right. Uh, so commitments, the elephant in the room. All right, let's get right back. So verbal commitments, what do they mean, how do they happen? All right, let's talk through a scenario. So you're playing this weekend, you do a really good job. You're playing for the 2019 team. Uh, doing an awesome job. Hey, Coach Kelly, uh, I saw, bless you, saw uh, Joe Smith play, loved uh, what I saw. What can you tell me about him? Uh, great kid, really good student, uh, really coming in the zone. You know, multi-sport athlete, oh, okay, great. Um, here's my number, could you ask him to call me? He will call the college coach, have a little dialogue, or maybe a parent will. Um, have a little dialogue, hey, you know, everything sounds good. Hey, we'd love to invite you to campus. You come to campus, you do a visit. Um, a visit could be just walking around, seeing the sites real quick, and then you leave. It could be meeting with the academic advisor. It could be going to a football or basketball game. It could be watching a practice. Um, all those different things. It could be multiple visits, whatever it may be. Um, and then um, at some point, um, I kind of joke with this whole scenario. It's like, like for, for you guys, I know this is a, probably something you don't want to think about. It's like eventually getting married, right? I like you, you like me, but I don't know if we're really ready. Oh, I'm ready. Well, you know, I'm sort of ready. How do I tell that person I'm ready? Um, it gets awkward. So, and because as a college coach, you want they want you to see what you need to see. You don't want to pressure you, but also don't want to lose the other guy. And so it's this awkward thing. But eventually, at some point, it's like, hey, just through the coach or just through conversation, hey, we're ready when you are. We really like you. We want to offer you a spot. Or conversely, bless you. Um, a young guy might go, coach, just want to let you know my parents went to your school. I 
always wanted to go there. I've seen what I need to see. I would love to cover school if you'll have me, or maybe the coach does that. And then at some point, you start, okay, well, I think we want to do this. And then there are some things that you have to kind of work through. So usually there are, like when people commit, there are parameters that you have, right? There are things that like, it's not just a commitment. At most schools it's, okay, we've looked at your, you know, your freshman year grades. For some of the early commits, we've seen how many smiley faces you've got. <laughs> <laughs> We expect that 92 to not go down, and here's a standardized test score that you need to shoot for. Do you think you can get that? Yes, we think we can get that. Okay, if you can get there, based on what the vision is telling us, historically, that guy has gotten, uh, has been accepted. No one's saying you're 100%. No coach will tell you that, and if they do, they're young and they don't know what they're doing. We don't work in vision. But we see enough transcripts and either take them to admissions and they give us kind of the thumbs up. Um, but they're, as a, like a freshman, they're not gonna say he's definitely in it. Um, but they'll, hey, looks pretty good. Tell them to keep doing the right thing. If everything looks good, we're okay. So we are kind of taking, taking a leap of faith on both sides. Um, but there's always some sort of uh, parameters that you're gonna have to work with. And if you don't test well, or your grades go down, yeah, it could be a problem. So, uh, so what usually happens, hey, we're gonna hold a spot for you, and then that young guy's like, hey, I'm coming, okay, this is what I wanna do. At any time, you can change your mind. Like, you commit to a school, you know what, I decided I don't wanna play lacrosse anymore, and I just, I'm moving to Hawaii, and I wanna serve, all right? Good luck, have fun. Uh, so again, that is, and for you young guys, it's your life. Like you have to really want to go to the school that you're going to. If you don't, honestly, you're better off like changing your mind, in my opinion, and going to a place you're really excited about. Because I don't think any college coach would want you to feel like, well, I have to go to that school because I told him I would go. And then you're sitting in the locker room and you're just not happy and you're not excited. I think all of us, we want guys who really want to be there. Um, so. That's why I think and we'll talk about kind of the process in a second, but you know, doing what you need to do to find that really good place. Uh, but they can be broken. Uh, it's bad pro uh, protocol, or it's you know, for us, like if we start dropping players for no reason, it's hard to come back here and try to recruit. So as a college coach, you got to be pretty confident in the decisions that you make. Um, for you all, unless like you know, you commit to random school, UCLA, you commit to UCLA and do a lacrosse program, hey, you know, you decide you commit to UCLA and then you change your mind, unless your brother, younger brother's goal since he was two was to go to UCLA, you're good to go. <laughs> well, if not the case, you basically screwed your younger brother. <laughs> so, like, because basically you can just go to a different school and it's over. For us, it's hard to go back to that high school coach or that club coach once for no reason, or at least no foreseeable reason, you just let them go. So again, I think usually people follow through on it, but it is happening more and more. There is more change because there's more changing uh, club teams and there's more changing high schools. So that's certainly going to trickle to the colleges as well. Um, so kind of work through that. Any questions with that? All right, that's usually a hot topic. Um, so this is new. My uh, senior year English uh, teacher would probably kill me. I don't even know if decommit is a word to use it. Um, so what impacts decommitments? Coaching changes. Um, you know, coach decides he just wants to retire or the administration decides it's time for him to retire. If you are committed to a school and you committed as a, a junior in senior year, new coach comes in, that coach with nothing signed can say, you know what, you're a really good player, but the way you play it really doesn't fit our staff. Like we're just gonna play differently. You were great for the old staff, but you're not necessarily great for our staff. So that's like sometimes people are excited about committing. The downside is you committed and the coach changed. And so sometimes people don't think about that, so you know, but that could happen. 
Uh, social choices, okay, not that it hasn't changed since, you know, the, the beginning of time. Alcohol, drugs, fighting at school, suspensions, things like that. Uh, <coughs> those are all things that it's above college coaches. It goes to admissions, it goes to the administration. They have to be comfortable with who you are as a person joining their community. So those bad choices, which I know you young guys, you hear it from the FCA guys, you hear it from your high school, you hear it from your parents. Why do you hear it? Because you've invested so much and they care so much about you. All it takes is one really bad choice and your future has taken a big turn, okay? And so thinking twice, acting once, thinking through your choices is really important. And that's why your parents have given you the line, which I heard a lot, <coughs> nothing good happens after, you know. For some of your parents, they probably would like to say eat. <laughs> but 11 or 12, right? Why? We want to save you from yourself. Because if you're out past 11 or 12, like, it's not gonna help you go where you wanna go long term. So, um, social choice are big. Social media, Coach Kelly and I were talking about this. Boy, I would not want to grow up right now like you guys do. Like you guys have so much access to information. Your phones are super cool. You have all this information that you can access. Here's the downside. Anytime you post something, you send something, you own it forever. And this is where the danger comes. Not only if it's something you send out, if you send it out, it's basically you're endorsing it. You like something, you retweet it. Even though you didn't say it, you're basically saying that's okay. So we will follow social media. We will track you, okay? And I'm not even lacrosse, basketball, football, softball, everybody tracks it. So you have to be super smart. If I'm you all, I don't send out anything, but I just watch what other people do. I get my information, but I just don't need to send out a whole lot, right? I mean, look at our president-elect. There's probably some things he would like to have not said to us. Now, he did become president, but that's a whole other discussion and someone else can lead I do not think so. Um, I'm not a big politics guy, so I'll stick to the other stuff. But that social media, if you can remember one thing from tonight, tonight, fellas, be really careful about what you send out. Be careful the pictures that you're in. Um, and even though if you just take a picture and send it out, think of it like a homework, Double check it, make sure there's nothing in there okay, before you send it out. Just take a half second, and the less you send out, probably the better. Um, and I'm not trying to lecture you. I've seen a lot of recruits lose opportunities, and a lot of college students get in trouble for social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, all that, Twitter, whatever it may be. Um, but that is becoming more prevalent and for parents, certainly having those discussions, talking about how they do it, I think it's really, really important. Uh, there's nothing that's more concerning when you're a college coach and you see something you're like, that would not fly here. Our people are going to be really upset. We better talk to him. Um, and then relaxing, taking your foot off the gas pedal. Um, grades go down. You used to play on you know, your FCA team, and now you're not playing. Um, you used to play for your high school team during the summer. You're not playing. Like, what is going on? Like, you don't seem like you're as committed as you used to be. Um, so relaxing, taking your foot off the gas pedal. Uh, my feeling always is when you get to be a senior, that needs to be your hardest year. You know, you're the next year going to have more academic um, requirements. You're going to be competing against an even higher level student. You're going to be playing against faster players. It's a big transition. The better you do in school, the better your quality of life. So writing good papers as a senior, um, having a really good foundation of math, Things like that are going to make freshman year better because you're not going to get stressed out. If you're not stressed out, you're going to play better. You play better, you're just going to be happy. So everything works together. Um, general info, we would all agree the process is broken uh, for lacrosse. We're working on it, but until it changes, um, you know, trying to make sure you educate yourself. And this is like the type of thing that I think can help. Uh, just hearing some things, talking to people, going to visiting school early. Um, just moving things up, at least trying to be educated and have a really thorough process. Uh, as I mentioned before, programs do have different approaches. Some are really aggressive, some are really laid back. A lot of teams are right in the middle. Um, sometimes you could be the very best 
player at your position and a school that is your dream school may not want you. Right? I just mentioned UCLA because it was a school that didn't have a problem. But let's say you're the best goalie in your class and you really want to go to UCLA. Well, you know what? UCLA has a 2021 goalie. The coach for UCLA is his son is a 2021 goalie. You're definitely better, but he's going to take the son. So is that fair? It's not really fair, but it's it's kind of like to me, it's a prime example of kind of where you're in life, you're starting to realize like life's not always fair, right? Like maybe that's where you wanted to go. Well, all right, gotta move on, gotta look for another opportunity. So um, you just have to make sure like sometimes it just works out that way. Um, or maybe you're a really good face-off guy. The year before, UCLA took the best face-off guy in the country. They're just not taking one this year, or they're not putting any scholarship money into that position. Doesn't mean you're not good, and a lot of schools would love to have you. Sometimes it just works out that way. And you can go on and on. A lefty attackman, you know, uh, a long symphony, whatever it may be. Um, so just understand, like, don't take it the wrong way. There might be, conversely, someone who absolutely loves you because you're exactly what they need in that class, and that sometimes works out to your advantage. Um, the athletics, just lacrosse, more is not always more. You do not have to play every day all summer. I'm sure, and I'm confident the FCA guys have talked to you about that. They've actually done a great job of trying to really be measured with what they do um, and work in conjunction with high school, which I think is really healthy. Um, all of us are going to see FCA teams. It's a great brand. Brian talked about it earlier. It's one of the best club teams around. It's going to be, we have to come see you. We will go to your games. We will see multiple games. So you're in really good shape. And don't worry about it. We will get there. Um, AP classes, um, this is always a big question. Uh, when I was at Harvard, and again, I'm just going off my experience, I never had a guy that they said, well, he doesn't have an AP for everything, so we can't take him. In my opinion, if you want to go to a top tier school, you need APs. But we're also talking about keeping your grades up really, really high. So if you take too many APs and you're stressed out and your grades go down, okay, you've got the APs, but your grades are suffering. Well, try to be strategic. Make sure you have some APs, but let's say you're taking Mrs. Smith's English class and she hasn't given out an A in three years. Maybe you take honors English and take AP history and AP math. Now you're showing you're not afraid to do the work, but you're also keeping that GPA up. And instead of taking the B there, you've gotten an A, and you've gotten an A, and you've gotten an A minus. Because college um, admissions, they want you to take rigorous courses, and they want your GPA to be up. So they want you to do both as well as possible. So APs, be strategic. You need them, but what I can tell you is if you don't have an AP in every single class, you're still going to get admitted. That is a great question to ask a college coach. Hey, Coach Shea from Yale, take a look at my transcript. I'm a freshman. What do you think I need to take for the next few years to look really good for you? Ask the coaches. They will give you really good feedback. But I think sometimes people, they go really hard and have too many APs or they're worried about it, or you don't take it. That is one that I think if you're strategic, you can get exactly what you need for those top tier schools, high GPA, rigorous workload. Uh, last few things, um, and then I'll open up for questions. Uh, the academic stuff, if you have A's, and I was not the most gifted athlete, I know you find that surprising. I was small, but I was slow. Um, <laughs> some of us are never going to be A-plus athletes. I just can't be. I can try and try. Some guys are not going to be A-plus students. Like, you just, you can, you can do pretty well, but you're just not, like, you're not wired that way. Can you get B's? Can you get B's? If you do all your homework, right? Can you get A's and B's? Right? Can you just stay away from C's and D's? Typically it means turning stuff on out of time, doing a little extra, right? Doing things when you need to, maybe not watching as much TV, staying off the computer or your, your phone a little bit. You've got to stay with A's and B's. A's, you're going to be able to look at every school in the country. And that's what you can control. Keep your options open. It's worth the investment. C's, you're basically really limiting your options. Because an admissions guy is going to say, he's getting C's in high school. How is he going to survive here? And we can't really answer that question. Because you're going to compete against really good students. They're going to have two to three hours more time than you have. So 
So you need to put that time in now. I'm sure your parents are on you guys. They're doing it because they want you to have options. So just know they wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't on you. Um, be a good citizen. When we call coaches, hey, saw Joey, what can you tell me about him? We love to hear, oh, great kid, team leader, you know, willing to play any position, uh, always high energy, uh, man, works down at uh, the community center, um, he's uh, very involved with his church, whatever it may be, love hearing that. Because it makes it yourself easier to admissions knowing that you're a good guy and you're doing a lot. So those things are really important. Having a positive attitude goes a long way. Uh, those extracurriculars, as I mentioned, are really good. If you're you know, in different clubs, things like that, and maybe you're not the greatest test taker, all right, try to round out your resume or your profile in other ways. Um, two, uh, one thing I think is always important, at some point you guys are gonna need recommendations from your school. You have to kind of look and say, all right, in my school, I need to get probably, and, and I would stick with your core, your, your math, English, and science. Think about two teachers that you can literally get to know, and they will know you, converse with them. And then you're gonna to need to ask them for a recommendation. You have to talk to them. Okay, I know as crazy as that sounds, you can't really text your teachers. <laughs> they need to know, hey, I play the local state lacrosse team, uh, we had a really good summer, I'm one of the captains, uh, I'm in the, um, uh, I, I, I'm a, um, altar boy, I have my own band, I am in school council, uh, I went down to such and such country and did some mission work. They need to write your story, you need to give them some things to write about. So, if it's your coach, great. If it's a neighbor, great. If it's somebody that's in your community, your friends know, you need to have a couple because it's so hard for a, a coach, or I'm sorry, a teacher, to write a really glowing recommendation when you come into class, and I was this guy, I came into class, kind of sat towards the back, didn't say much, and then I handed him a piece of paper. Well, that's how old I am. Um, you know, you're asking them basically, hey, here's, here's you know, the link, click on it, and basically fill out your recommendation. When I was in high school, for the young guys, like we basically had stone tablets. <laughs> That's how we did all our work. Um, now you guys have a lot easier. But you need to have those recommendations, so just get to know a couple people. Um, videos with links are always great. Um, my opinion would be have good games on there, whether it's good high school games or FCA against, um, you know, Long Island Express or the orange, those, those evil 91 orange crushers. I am waiting for that to <laughs> um, But like having good games is really important. And my two cents would be if you're doing a video, you want to make sure that you are painting a picture of your skills. So let's say you're an attackman. Show, like don't just show, here's me from 10 yards, right-handed goal, right-handed goal, right-handed goal. You want to show I can feed, show a feed. Show riding and getting the ball back. Show that you can finish. Show going to your offhand. So with all these highlights, what you're showing that coach is, I can do a lot of things well. So don't just show the same type of goals. Be strategic. You are painting a picture for yourself. And you can do highlights. If your highlights, I wouldn't do it more than four or five minutes. And if you want to show like a game or half game, a good team, a good team. Um, I, uh, visiting schools, I would do it during the school year as much as you can because I think you get a really good idea of what the student body's like and the energy from the school. Going to class I think is good. I would try to see school as many times as you can. It's not always uh, available to you, but if you do multiple visits, I always think that's good. It's almost like a movie. Sometimes the second time you see things you didn't see the first time. Um, and then again, if you're playing this weekend and whatever it may be, uh, hey, send out an email to the schools and just you know let them know, hey, this is where I'm going to be. My recommendation, if you're writing to a school, um, at every school, if you go to UCLA Athletics or Syracuse Athletics, there's going to be a staff directory. Go to the staff directory. If you're going to write something to a coach, send it to every coach on that list. Because ultimately, there's, there's normally one recruiting coordinator within the staff. And some of us that are old, we're not the greatest with email, but if you send it to the head coach and all three assistants, somebody's gonna get that. So why not just send it to all of them first one, 
and then somebody's going to grab it, or it's going to get forward to that person anyway. Uh, the only thing I would say is if you're sending it to college coaches and you're going to have kind of a template, just make sure when you're going from the one school to the next school, <laughs> change it. I am not that coach at Marymount. Um, I'm sure it's a great school, but that is different. You know, you know so um, you always want to double check if you're going to change the name of the coach and the name of the school. There's certainly nothing wrong. You don't have to write that email all over again. In what grade would you suggest starting to send email? Uh, I mean, now, I mean, I think once you're in high school, I would probably do that. I would say once you're in high school. And it also depends on the school. Um, I would talk to the coaches and just say, hey, I'm looking at these schools. Do you think I need to, to reach out to them as freshmen, or can I wait? I think that's something I would definitely talk to your coach about. But I think starting freshman year, I don't think you have to do that in year one or that, at least right now. Now, the way we look at things now is very different than we were looking at them five years ago. So at this point, that's the, I think the way I would look at it. Um, and again, I think asking that question to your coaches, um, that's one of the reasons, that I think one of the benefits that you get from being on the club team. Um, and prospect days, I would have told you five years ago, don't do them. I think prospect days are really beneficial now if you have a couple things. If you talk to the coaches and say, hey coach, these are my dream schools. Do you think these are a good fit? Yeah, I think they're good fits. Okay. Um, look and see if they have prospect days. And then call the program and say, hey, I saw that you have a prospect day. Can you tell me how many people are going to be your prospect, prospect day? And this is just my opinion, and it doesn't mean like it's perfect, but in my opinion, I would want to go to a prospect day that's under 100 people. Um, anything 60, 50, awesome. Why? You're really going to that prospect day to get to know the kids, get to know the coaches, be on that campus, be coached by them. If you have 500 kids at a prospect day, like is the coach gonna see you, is he gonna work with you? I don't think you're gonna get seen that much, but boy, if you go to a prospect day for a couple days and it's not very big, that means the coaches, if you're on one field, that staff is gonna see you for the whole time you're there. To me, that's awesome. So they're gonna, they're gonna do the drills with you. They're gonna see you play full field. They're gonna see you do uh, little things. They're gonna coach you up and say, hey, try to do it this way, and then you'll get a chance to take that and do it well. Now you're really, you're basically working with that coach. That's gonna be like practice. You're getting a trial run there. So I think the prospect days can be really good. I do think probably just kind of knowing what's out there, you probably get hundreds and hundreds of inquiries. I'm sure these guys do. So be strategic because you can waste a lot of money at a lot of different prospect days. So I would definitely be strategic, talk to the coaches about that. Um, and with that, when it comes to uh, the different things that are out there, I think playing with teams who know who you are are really helpful. So that means playing with your high school team, playing with your club team, I would put really high up there on the pecking order. I would say playing for, um, doing your prospect days are advantageous as well. There's nothing wrong with the showcases. And if you want to do them, that's great. I think showcases sometimes can be really good for kids that don't have great programs. Um, you know, they're a rural area, or maybe they're not playing for a club team. They get a chance to play against some of the best. But you are taking a little bit of a risk when you go to a prospect day. They can be really well organized. They can have a lot of good players. But if you are a goalie and you get the best face-off guy at prospect or at that showcase, and you win every face-off, you could go through a whole half and not face a shot. So, like to me, that's a little bit of a potluck situation. It's the same thing. You show up. There's six attackmen. Five are left-handed. Okay, who's going to play the right side? You, that's out of your hands. When you play for a club team, you are practicing. Like the coaches know, like this is what you do well. We're going to put you in a position to do well. You're going to be organized. You're going to play faster. You're going to be more confident, right? Because you're going to know the terminology. So there's nothing wrong with the showcases, but just to try to save you some money. Um, I think it can get really expensive. There were guys last year, and some guys can shuffle that are in here. We saw guys go from one showcase to like, they went from like Under Armour to like, or Maverick to Under Armour to um, Jake Reed to some other thing. It was like 12 days of lacrosse in 100 degree heat. It was a really tough go. So it, it sounds great at the time, but man, that's a lot to ask. So.
So being strategic, I think, can be really helpful there. Um, and most of us are going to see you in a lot of different areas. So more doesn't always mean more, for sure. Um, and your, your guidance counselor should be able to help you with this. I would research the ACTs uh, versus the USATs. Some guys just seem to do better on the ACTs versus the SATs. That's a really good question for your college counselor, guidance counselor. Um, and they can probably give you more feedback there. Uh, in my opinion, taking the SATs by the end of your sophomore is really helpful before summer so that you have a baseline. And let's say, and we realize that you haven't probably had all the math, so that's probably going to go up. But for the English, if you don't do well, you have all summer to maybe look and, and kind of go, all right, how do we want to attack this English thing? Do we need to work on our, our writing skills or grammar, um, whatever our conversation is? Um, and then you kind of sneak that in a little bit before you take it. If you don't take it in May or June, your next opportunity is three, four months later. Uh, I think the first SAT is typically off um, in October, and the first ACT is September. So that's you know that's the, the ninth month in your September. If you don't take it, if you take it in May, you have four months to really get prepped for that test. Everywhere I've been, they've done what's called super score, which means if you take the ACT four times. They're going to take the best in all those areas and, and, and really take your best composite score. It was the same thing at Harvard. If you had a really good math score the first time and the second time your English went way up, right, they would basically uh, take your best. If they didn't see the worst, they would take your best. So I would certainly do your prep work. And fellas, the, the, the standardized tests aren't very fun, but they are really important for schools. So do the best you can with that. It's just kind of one of those things you need to do. Um, don't get you ready for taxes. That's something. <laughs> 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 uh, so, one, one thing, just going back to the prospect days, and, and it kind of goes back to one of the first slides. Um, you know, as as parents, uh, and I think maybe touched on this in the opening meeting, is you have to know your your son, okay? And you have to you have to be realistic. Um, you know, as you look at prospect days. Are you going to send your son, who really needs a small class environment, to go to a big school prospect day? And again, go back to that first slide and what the considerations are relative to the schools that you that are in the, the, the mix, okay? And, and be realistic relative to, to the prospect days that you then go. Because it, it it's not going to do your sons any good to set them up and say, yeah, you know, here's Here's this school where you can go to the prospect there, they'll fall in love with the campus, but you know deep down, because you spend a lot of time with them, that that's really not a fit for them at the end of the day. Um, so I, I think it's really important for, for us, you know, as a club to be resources for you guys, um, but also to again remember that you know you 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 know your kids. And they may have stars in their eyes, but you, you have to be realistic. And that can help you be a good consumer relative to the dollars and, and where you where you uh, put your time and effort and energy. And I think the last thing I would leave is it's not a race, it's it's doing it to the right. Like the way we kind of look at it now is, you know, I remember way back when I was a senior, I remember I was making their choices and parents going, all right, you know, it's November, you've made your decision, you have six or seven months to screw this up. You know, kind of joking, right? You gotta keep your nose clean and keep doing the right things. Uh, think about it this way: When guys do commit early, you, you know, there's you have four years to make sure you're doing things the right way, and you're, you're under a little bit more of a microscope. So, what what it tells me is the odds are, if ten guys commit, right, out of those ten, one probably is going to make a bad choice, like a significantly bad choice. It just the odds are that way. So, what you can't look at and get too fixated on, and I know it's hard. Um, is like when people start committing, it doesn't always mean they're going to end up there. Um, and like the process works itself out. And there are guys moving and changing. We saw it in the last two weeks guys that were sent to analyze and sign them, someone else sent them an LI, they're going there, guys decommitted. There's a lot of movement, and it, there's going to be opportunities. Again, good student, good player, good person. You could blossom as a senior, and it'll happen. Shoot, we had 
Uh, Wade, one of the guys that's a senior at Gilman now, signed his NLI. He was committed at um, Air Force. He took a, from what he told me, he took a medical exam, found out he was colorblind, couldn't fly. He really wanted to fly. That changed his whole deal. So then he had to open things back up again last summer. So that's kind of a fleeting feeling. So things happen, right? And things worked out great. So, but why? Really good kid, hard worker, right? Good person, good player. So those are things that you guys can control. Uh, the Ivies do work slower, so, you know, in some schools just by nature, like Loyola, I know Coach Toomey very well, but they work slower. Uh, some schools work faster, but I'm telling you, like, just control what you can control. There are some guys that will make choices, and you hope it all works out, but the odds are some guys are going to change their mind, some guys are not going to play lacrosse, um, some guys may play a different sport, or... Maybe something happens and they make a bad choice. Or the coaching staff changes and all of a sudden uh, things open up that weren't available before. Um, so I know that with right with some of the things we showed today, it could be anxious you know, for everybody. I get it. But at the end of the day, if you're getting up every morning and checking out who committed and this and that, you are going to drive yourself crazy. And I, I know it's hard. I get it. But at the end of the day, again, a verbal commit is a verbal commit. Doesn't mean it's always working out. Um, and so by doing the right thing, keeping your grades up and working hard, you increase your odds. And if a guy commits and takes his foot off the gas and you want to work him, I'm not sure that guy's going to end up there anyway. Um, I will open it up for questions. I know you guys have done an awesome job back there. You guys are probably, you know, we're past our attention span time. Uh, listen, short speeches make long friendships. So, uh, how about